Hey guys, I'm back, finally. Holy cow, it's been months. I've been super busy. I haven't had time to do much of anything in the way of videos. But I have picked up a lot of stuff. Uh, from eBay, various auctions, coin shows. Uh, it's going to take a while to get through all this stuff. So there's more than a few videos worth for sure. And of course I got a few boxes from PCGS just sitting here that I haven't opened because I haven't had time to make a video of it. But things are settling down a little bit and hopefully I'll be able to put together a few more videos. And by the way, if you're here looking for a gold mining video, it's been 40 below up there in the Yukon this winter. And there's been nobody up there mining, including me. Uh, but it's starting to warm up and I'll be heading back up there in a couple months. So uh, have a look at some coins in the meantime. How about that? And I want to start off with one of the uh, classic American coins, a Morgan dollar, 1883. This was designed by George Morgan. He was British. Uh, he agreed to come over to the U.S. as an assistant engraver in 1876. And I remember the first Morgan dollar was made in 1878. So he hit this home run while he was young. He eventually stayed with the U.S. men his entire career which ended up being his whole life because uh, he was the chief engraver in 1925 when he died. He was 79 years old, extremely talented, and underutilized his whole career as far as I'm concerned. This one's a little special in a couple of ways. First, uh, it's got mirrored fields and frosty devices. What's that mean? It's a deep mirror-proof light coin, I think. A dimple. And secondly, have a look at that mint mark. CC, made in Carson City, Nevada. In fact, in this very building, most probably from this exact press 135 years ago. This is coin press number one, as it looks today. This is the original press, and it's still in the original building, which is now a state museum. For the first five years of operation, this is the only press that Carson City Mint used. This is how the building looked right after completion, 1869. One year later, 1870, the first coins were produced. Five years later, they added a bigger press, and shortly after that, a, another smaller one. This press originally was belt-driven through the use of line shafts and pulleys uh, from a steam engine that was in the back part of the building. It's electrified now. You can see the electric motor there on the lower right, but uh, originally it was not powered. Uh, when you read about this type of press, people often refer to it as a steam-powered press. And I have a problem with that. Now, now, technically, it was powered by steam, but literally there were no steam fittings anywhere on this machine. In fact, there are no fittings for any power at all. There's just a steel wheel. This press wasn't specifically designed to run on steam. You could have had a water wheel outside or even horses going around in a circle for that matter power in this thing. And I'll show you why. This is the way it was powered in 1870. This is a 40 horse steam engine like the one that could have operated at Carson City. This one machine would have operated the whole mint. Like I said, it was in a back room somewhere and had to be connected to every machine in the building physically by a series of these leather belts and line shafts. Upstairs, downstairs, every room that needed power had to be connected with this system. This is how they turned on every machine. A lever slid the belt off the idler and onto a drive wheel that was connected to the particular belt for whatever machine you were working on. That was the on-off switch, a lever. The equipment on the second floor was powered by belts that went up through holes that were cut in the floor. I mean, this, this noise went on all day. As long as they were working, they heard these belts going and these wheels turning. There was no electricity. It's, it's amazing what those guys did back then. But anyway, this particular press has a great history. It was used here at Carson City Mint from 1870 when it was new until the Mint stopped producing coins in 1893. 
and it sat idle here in this building until it was moved to the Philadelphia Mint 1899, where it was used through 1930 when it was fitted with an electric motor up until 1945 when they needed it in the San Francisco Mint. So it was moved up there until 1955 when that mint temporarily shut down. So by this time, 1955, the press had been running for 85 years and it was finally scheduled to be scrapped. But luckily there was a guy who collected Carson City coins and heard about this. He wrote a letter to the state of Nevada telling him what was happening. The Nevada State Museum negotiated a deal with the Mint to buy the press. They paid 225 bucks. That was the salvage value of the thing. And they returned it to the original Mint building. And I guess they put it in right through the front door. But the building was by then converted to a museum. And it sat there as a display. The press sat there until 1964. Now remember what happened in 1964 as far as coins were concerned in this country. We were changing over to clad coins, that's it. And the people were hoarding all the silver coins because they knew they were going to stop making them. So there was a nationwide coin shortage. And the officials at the U.S. Mint uh, knew that this press was still in the Nevada State Museum and they actually requested that it be shipped to the Denver Mint, which it was. And it was used there for another three years, striking more than 188 million more coins. I mean, it's just incredible. This thing is a workhorse. It's the only press to have been uh, used at four different U.S. Mints. A great piece of history. And this is not the only thing here. They've got loads of super cool stuff. Now here's something I know you're going to like, a coin collection, an amazing coin collection. This was put together by a wealthy Carson City businessman years ago. His name was Norman Biltz. And in this collection he had one of every Carson City coin ever minted, except two. He was missing two coins. And I, I think he doesn't have those two because they were not available to purchase. I don't think they were available when he was collecting. Nobody was selling them. They're, they're very rare. Uh, the first one's an 1873 No Arrows dime, which today has a value of about $1.8 million, and the 1873 No Arrows quarter, which is worth about $400,000. Uh, now, just before uh, Mr. Biltz died, he was offered $100,000 for this whole collection. And at that time, I mean, that was a lot of money. This was in the early 70s, but he refused that offer and instead sold it to a local bank for half of that. But they had to follow three of his orders. Uh, one, they could never sell the collection. Two, the collection could never leave Nevada. And three, it had to be displayed on a regular basis. So what better place to display it than the Carson City Mint Museum? And here it is. And it's actually in one of the actual vaults of the Mint. They also have some really cool canceled dies. Look at these things. Uh, an 1873 Seated Liberty half dollar an 85 Morgan dollar, a gold eagle, and a double eagle. Now these are worn out dies that have been filed so you so they can't be used again. Uh, Philadelphia normally uh, required all the worn out dies from its branch mints to be returned to them for uh, destruction, but Carson City was so far away they didn't want to pay for the shipping. So uh, they allowed the San Francisco and the Carson mints to destroy their own dyes in-house. But have a look at this. This dye was used for years as a doorstop in some old lady's house in Virginia City. Uh, it turns out uh, one of her relatives used to work at the Mint as an assayer and apparently just brought the thing home one day. It's uh, a reverse dye for Seated Liberty Half and uh, it was eventually auctioned off for almost $20,000 in 2003. And after it was studied, more closely, it turns out that this was the very first die used at this mint in 1870. It struck the very first half dollars. But anyway, if you're ever close to Carson City, you definitely need to stop in to this place and have a look. I mean, look at this. It's a beautiful building. And they also have a mock mine shaft section inside this uh, that's really well done. 
And, I mean, take it from a guy who's been in a lot of abandoned mine shafts. They did a great job. Beautiful job. Definitely check it out. But... All right, back to my little piece of Carson City history. Look at that. That thing is just so frosty. The light is just uh, crazy on that. It does have some bag marks. I can You can see that, so that's going to stop it from getting a super good grade. But look at how frosty that is. Really something. I'll put my finger back here. That's like more than a foot away. You can see my finger. <laughs> That's like a mirror. Let's look at the reverse again. This reverse is very nice too. The reverse is better than the obverse. Super nice. Beautiful. Let's have a look back here. Yeah, look at that. Wow. Fabulous, but it does have these these marks. It's been banged a little bit by other coins, but I think it's it's an it's an average uh, to me average grade coin for MS. So I'm just gonna guess a 63. That's probably what I think it would be. Let's try it. Let's see what they said. MS 63 dimple yes there you go deep mirror proof like that's what I thought I don't know how they couldn't have done that and the strike is pretty nice too anyway beautiful I'm happy with that okay this one is very interesting to me and I'm anxious to uh, see the grade it's an 1894 S Morgan. Now, this coin has a couple of unique things. First, it's a key date. It's expensive in any min state grade. And this looks obviously MS, but it has another uh, peculiar thing. And I have a close up photo of this coin so you can see a little better. Look at those parallel scratch lines running across the high points. There's some over her cheek, some near the end of her cap, and even on the star near the rim. All the lines run exactly parallel to each other and they don't appear in the fields at all and the luster appears all throughout the scratches you can see where the luster has been disturbed by the contact after the coin was made the black marks so what happened did someone mess with this coin someone just ruined a very expensive coin maybe but i think you uh <laughs> hot shots already have some guesses and let me show you quickly a few other coins I found on eBay that also have those same marks. Those scratches, in my opinion, couldn't have occurred after the coin was minted. The luster isn't broken at all around them. And they're too parallel, in my opinion, to have been put there by a human. And I know the coin hasn't been put through some Coke machine where the mechanism might have scratched it. I don't know any $1 Coke machines. So I think you got to look a bit farther back in how this coin was made. So I'm going to get a little technical here. If you're not at all interested in the technical aspects of making coins, just fast forward to the grading reveal part. I know everyone's got a different attention span, so feel free. Bump, bump this thing up ahead. But otherwise, check this out. I believe these lines are what's known as strip scratches. And the strip I'm referring to is the silver strip of metal that the coin blank was originally pressed from and eventually made into a planchet and stamped into a finished coin. I want to show you as briefly as I can how the strips were made at this time year uh, in 1894 because the methods changed as years went on. Uh, this is what they did and I'm gonna skip to the stage immediately after melting and refining. Once the metals melted and refined they end up with a cast silver bar and they first put that through a rolling mill many times to reduce the thickness to somewhere close to what the final coin will be. And the strip ends up being about five feet long. Now the final thickness adjusting machine they used was called a draw bench. They covered the silver strips with lard to use as a lubricant and the metal was pulled through an adjustable rectangular die. This part in my opinion is where the scratches happened either the lard was contaminated or the dyes were damaged in some way something in that die scratched that strip perfectly parallel all the way down the strip as it was being pulled so the workmen probably were familiar with this happening and 
believed that the scratches would be removed later on down the road by the press. I mean, there's 100 tons of pressure going to be put on this piece of metal, which makes sense. And most of the time, the scratches probably were removed, but in my coin's case, they didn't all disappear. Another interesting photo uh, I'll go over quickly is the draw bench room in San Francisco around 1885. And you can see the two, there's actually three draw benches in this room, along with a lot of other cool stuff. I'm going to show you. It's hard to see it. And if you're looking at it, this video on a cell phone, you might not see it. But if you've got a big monitor, you can see some pretty cool stuff in here. Beside the draw benches, there's the silver strips that are being processed. And once they do run them through and they believe that that's correct, they'll punch out a blank, a test blank on one end of the strip. Uh, and there's two blank presses here for that. And they'll put it on the blank scale that's sitting there. And they'll see if it weighs correctly. If it weighs correctly, they've, they'll finish punching out all the coins. If it doesn't weigh correctly, I think they'll just throw it back and it'll be remelted and run again. And you can see the, the boxes there of the blanks. They just come out through that little tube there at the end of the blank press. And, and once they punch out all the, all the blanks, the, the scrap or the sizzle, you can see it sitting there on either side. And they'll ship all that back to the melting room. And now that you know how these machines are run, you can recognize these big flywheel guards uh, that look like big drums. Underneath there are the, the giant flywheels with the leather belts that are going down through the floor that are powering these machines. Like I said, every machine has to have a belt going to it and a flywheel, and uh, even the, the punch presses have to be powered. And the, and the thing in the front there is a guard. There's a lot of flywheels underneath these things. And they're going down to uh, to those line shafts down below. Anyway, interesting photo. I thought I'd share it with you. But let's get back to this coin. You know, in the end, the scratches are not prominent. I mean, you really got to look at this coin to see those scratches. And it's, it's such a nice coin. I really like this coin. It's a key date or semi-key date. It's in great condition. And it's got what I think is a manufacturing defect it's got something the mint did to it that uh is a little bit unusual it's not that unusual i notice I've, I've found a few others but uh it's a great coin and no matter what they say or what grade they they give it i'm still gonna like it so let's have a let's finally have a look and see what they've done the, the, it's it's whether they they knocked it down from those scratches if they're gonna sixty three that's fantastic a sixty three that's great they did not I don't think they considered those they they knocked off of those scratches at all this looks like a a straight m s sixty three coin to me and I'm happy that's uh that's worth some some money, folks. That's that's a great coin, but like I said, it, it didn't really matter if the grade was was high or low. I really like this coin. All right, looks like I'm gonna run out of time here. Let me finish up with a couple things I picked up on eBay, and then I'll continue the rest of this unboxing in the next video. Have a look at this. Since I'm on a kind of a Carson City, Nevada theme. This is a 1964 Nevada State Centennial Proof Commemorative. It's not from the U.S. Mint, just silver round. But I thought it was really cool in the proof version. It's 90% silver. And the obverse has a, a likeness of John William McKay, who was a famous Nevada resident in the late 1800s. He was born in Ireland and came to California with the other 49ers. Looking to strike it rich. He did get some gold in California, but uh, he decided to try his luck in Nevada and ended up hitting the biggest silver ore deposit in the Comstock load. Instant millionaire. He used that wealth later on to organize a communications business and eventually laid underwater telegraph cables across the Atlantic to England. He became a very wealthy man. But on this coin... He still looks like he did when he was 25 years old, holding a pickaxe and a big piece of probably high-grade silver ore there. 
the reverse has uh, the Hoover Dam, which is actually half in Nevada, half in Arizona, since the, the boundary line is the Colorado River. has a missile there representing all the government military testing they do in Nevada, along with some uh, ranch animals below and some wheat there to represent agriculture in the state. I really like this proof. It's in great shape. They have others that are not proof. I didn't think it's for so hot, but this cameo effect really makes this nice, and so I thought I'd pick it up. The next one is a trade token from about 1915. Carson Hot Springs. Good for five cents in trade. Carson Hot Springs is a, a natural spring, and it's about two miles from the Carson City Mint. It was originally known as Swift's Hot Springs in 1880, and then uh, eventually it was bought out, and the name was changed to Carson Hot Springs around 1910. It still exists today. It has a nice restaurant, lots of uh, natural hot water pools. I, uh, the, ground, the water comes out about 115 degrees from the ground, and I wonder if they'd take this uh, <laughs> coin uh, if I went up there. I want my five cents, and... Uh, in the hot tub. Uh, anyway, there's people there every day. It's a busy place and uh, still operational. And I think I'll end the, with this Nevada State Round commemorating the U.S. Bicentennial, which is it's kind of complicated. The state of Nevada made one similar to this for the U.S. Centennial Celebration in 1876. That coin looks like this. And these are expensive. This one's worth more than 2000 bucks, But for the bicentennial in 1976, they actually reused the original 100-year-old obverse die and used it actually for the reverse of this coin along with a newly designed obverse. And what they did was to put the dies in the number one press you saw earlier at the Carson City Mint and made this commemorative with that press. You can see the CC mint mark here on the bottom. Pretty cool. This was made in that in the Carson City Mint. It's supposed to be three nines pure silver. It also has some awesome edge toning. I hope you can see it there. It's beautiful. Comes in this plastic holder, which is kind of scratched. Uh, but I thought it was pretty neat. I think I'm going to make another holder for these Nevada coins I have, and I'll uh, show it to you when I get that done. Anyway, that's about all I have for now. Thanks for watching, guys.